uh, we'll start. We'll start with a peace invocation. Om Sarve Pavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Vadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschit Dukha Bhag Bhavet Hari Om. Welcome everyone uh, to this first health talk. Uh, today we will be presenting it uh, as part of a series of health talks to be given for the benefit of our congregation, as well as the larger Austin community, uh, whoever are interested. And CMA has and continues to provide invaluable resources and guidance for spiritual growth. As seekers, we are also in need of a healthy body uh, mind and intellect that can cooperate with us on this journey. And uh, we do have in our congregation expertise to improve the physical well being of our devotees and others. And hence, we are attempting to tap this resource to present to all some often overlooked measures for prevention and detection of diseases and maintenance of good health. So reinstating our twofold mission, we want to educate everyone um, about common afflictions that come with advancing age. And second, we want to promote a healthy lifestyle, including diet, exercise, et cetera, as measure of prevention. Uh, I recall some years ago when I was in practice, Every year I would go to our college meeting and at the end of each talk, when they discuss some ideas or medicine to help uh, modify the disease process, they would say at the end, only thing we can say and advise is lifestyle changes. Lifestyle ch changes are crucial to our ability to uh, face the diseases that come and our ability to, to some extent, push them back or prevent them. So in keeping with these goals, we have planned a series of talks by experts who will present briefly some common ailments afflicting especially South Asians. Often these are silent and not detectable in the beginning and later somehow present as a catastrophic illness, uh, such as high blood pressure, hypertension, high sugar, diabetes, heart disease and stroke, warning signs of these illnesses, high cholesterol, as well as prevention and screening procedures for like, for example, cancer, then healthy lifestyle changes, diet and exercise and women's health, et cetera. So this concept has the approval of both our CMA executive board, board as well as Brahmachari uh, Shuchitachi. So let me now introduce today's speaker, who is Dr. Kunjan Bhatt, uh, a well-regarded practicing cardiologist here in town at Austin Heart, affiliated with Heart Hospital of Austin and Seton Medical Center. He will talk for about 15 minutes on the topic of hypertension and South Asians and uh, what it means health-wise to have high blood pressure. And the audience will have additional 10 minutes to ask questions uh, at the end of his brief talk. So without further ado to Kunjan, welcome. Hari Om everyone. Uh, Minanti, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, it is an honor to be here today. Um, this has been something that has been of the interest, I think, of our community for a long time. And uh, through the efforts of the board, the advisory committee, um, I think, and uh, actually a, a lot of initiative from my better half, Rupal, um, uh, and also guidance from our senior members, especially knowledgeable members like Minanti, who has done this successfully in her previous journeys in, other, in another city, um, we are hoping to do something similar in our community here in Austin, where we have a wealth of resources in the healthcare community 
um, to further everyone's knowledge. Um, in addition to spiritual health, uh, spiritual wealth, we want to have true good health as well. So without further ado, um, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, I think Mina and I can see you. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Okay, fantastic. So my talk is entitled Hypertension in the South Asian. Again, my name is Gunjan. I am a cardiologist. My practice is Austin Hart. And um, I'm looking forward to giving you some thoughts that are near and dear to me. So today, just a brief overview, we're gonna talk about the scope of the problem. What is hypertension? Um, the epidemiology and the scope of the problem. Heart effects of high blood pressure. Something we commonly know and I like to call the South Asian paradox and then managing your risk. So first of all, what is hypertension? What is high blood pressure? I will use the terms hypertension and high blood pressure uh, interchangeably because they are synonymous. They mean the same thing. Um, what is blood pressure? Before we talk about hypertension, what is blood pressure in general? It is the pressure of blood pushing against the walls of your arteries. Uh, we need blood pressure. Blood pressure is not a bad thing. Blood pressure needs to exist so that when the heart forms a beat, when the heart squeezes, that blood moves to the body and can perfuse the vital organs of the body. <clears throat> we now know for decades of research, what are different categories of blood pressure? We now define by the American Heart Association by the most recent guidelines, normal blood pressure as 120 over 80 or less. Now I did mention two numbers, 120 top number systolic, 80 bottom number diastolic. What do those two numbers mean? As I mentioned, the heart is the responsible organ to generate blood pressure. When the heart beats, when the heart squeezes, that generates that top number systolic. When the heart relaxes, the arteries relax as well, and that generates that second number, the bottom number, the diastolic. So we define normal systolic and diastolic pressures as 120 by 80 or less. And note, it has to be both. To have normal blood pressure, you have to be both less than 120 and less than 80. Elevated numbers in this kind of in this grid, if you will, um, the yellow bar, elevated numbers that aren't quite high, but are, are you know, sort of on the yellow, on the yellow alert uh, would be in the 120 to 130 range over um, a less than 80. So 120s over 80 or less is considered to be elevated, but not quite high. Stage one hypertension, high blood pressure is now defined as a blood pressure of 130 to 139 over 80 to 89 meaning that you can have a blood pressure of 135 over 70, and that's high. You can have a blood pressure of 125 by 85, and that's high. Stage two hypertension, slightly higher numbers, 140 or higher on top, 90 or higher on the bottom. Where we think of patients as having a crisis, if their blood pressure is above 180 and over 120. Um, so those are pretty high numbers that really require prompt medical attention. So that's the general broad categories of normal tension, borderline elevation, and elevated numbers. Our goal blood pressure, again, as stated by this chart, is less than 130 over 80. How many of us are affected by blood pressure? In America, 47 of adults, nearly half of the adults in America have hypertension. 116 million Americans have hypertension. It's a staggering number. Half of every other person that you know who's an adult has hypertension. Unfortunately, only one out of four adults who have high blood pressure actually have it under control. This is important because over 500,000 Americans in 2019 had heart, high blood pressure as their primary or contributing cause of death. And that would be from a stroke or a heart attack. In terms of prevalence, 50% of men and 44% of women have um, high blood pressure. Looking at um, different races, African-Americans at 56%, Caucasians at 48%, Asians at 46%, and Hispanics at 39%. Another staggering number, nine out of 10 Americans will develop hypertension in their lifetime. Nine out of 10, 90% will develop hypertension during their lifetime. This is somewhat of an age-dependent process, so in people in their teens to 30s, the prevalence is around 7.5%. Between 40 to 50 years young, 33%. 
people above their 60s, 63%. I'm much more of a visual person, so this uh, circular graph sort of spoke to me. If you think of the population of 100% of, of, of hypertensives, 116 Americans, if you will, only half know that they have it, only one third are receiving treatment, and only uh, one quarter actually have their blood pressure under control, suggesting the other 75% don't have it under control. The reason this is important is because if you reduce your top number, if you are hypertensive, and you reduce that top number by 20 points or more, it can decrease your mortality by over 50%. We know there are many risk factors that lead to heart disease and heart disease can lead to death. But I think all of us are interested in how do we live longer and live healthier. So we know that controlling risk factors for heart disease leads to a decrease in cardiovascular mortality. But hypertension really kind of takes the cake here because of its prevalence, if we can control blood pressure, we can decrease cardiovascular mortality by over 50%, much more than high cholesterol and the other risk factors listed here. This is not to dismiss or poo-poo these other risk factors. This is simply to say that hypertension control is of uh, paramount importance. So people commonly ask me in, in, in my office, uh, you know, what are the symptoms I need to watch out for? I think we are all, always very in tune with our bodies of how do I feel and when I feel differently, what should I look for? Um, unfortunately with hypertension, they call it the silent killer for exactly this reason. Many of us who have maybe borderline mild hypertension, it is silent, it is clinically silent, there are no symptoms. These are not people who are walking around feeling short of breath, funny feelings in the chest, bad headaches. Uh, most commonly, people who have hypertension don't feel bad. So that's the, the problem. We call this a silent killer because it is commonly not associated with symptoms. For that reason, it is essential that we all get our blood pressure checked regularly. Now, this, I make that statement not saying that everyone today needs to check their blood pressure on a daily basis. It is important that you dialogue with your primary care doctor to say, do I have high blood pressure? If you don't have high blood pressure, getting your blood pressure checked at your annual physicals may be more than sufficient. But those of, do, those of you who have borderline or elevated blood pressures, the common dialogue with your primary care doctor or with your specialist would be home blood pressure monitoring. And it is crucial that you check your blood pressure once a day at the same time of day. When symptoms do occur from hypertension, they can include headaches, nosebleeds, palpitations, visual changes, and buzzing in the ears. Severe hypertension can also cause symptoms like nausea, fatigue, confusion, anxiety, chest pain, and even tremors. So blood pressure, just shown here, I'm a very visual person, so I, I don't know if um, you would benefit from, from seeing this picture, on the left side of the screen is a model um, of a normal heart. The heart has four chambers. There are two chambers on the right side in the screen, they're depicted on the left. And there are two chambers on the left in the screen, they're depicted on the right. It's sort of flip-flop with how we would sort of think about it. And the chambers are called the left and right atria and the left and right ventricles. The left ventricle is the main pumping chamber of the heart. That is the chamber that generates blood pressure, but it is also pumping against blood pressure. And when there's high blood pressure, we measure blood pressure, of course, in the branch of, an, of the aorta, the main blood vessel of the body in the arm um, or in the leg or where we check blood pressure. But when we check blood pressure, we're measuring aortic pressure. Aortic pressure is uh, measured in the arm as a surrogate. If you think of someone having high blood pressure, this aortic pressure is very high. If that pressure is high, the heart is pumping against it. And as there is a significant load to the heart, the heart responds by thickening, enlargening. And you think of a thickening muscle in your bicep or in your quadricep muscles as a good thing. Though the heart is muscle, it does not need to thicken to work better. In fact, it works less efficiently. So uncontrolled blood pressure thickens the heart, enlarges the heart, depicted on this schematic to the right, which can lead to a whole host of problems, arrhythmias, um, congestive heart failure, where the heart pump is not pumping efficiently and unable to keep up with the demands of the body. And other bad things, of course, can happen as well. So what are the risk factors for high blood pressure? There are modifiable risk factors, and there are non-modifiable risk factors. I think it's important to know both, and of course, to focus on the modifiable ones as we can potentially do something about them. So modifiable risk factors includes an unhealthy diet. Um, an unhealthy diet, 
stated very broadly and vaguely here, we are going to have lectures in the future that will go into these things in much more detail, but excessive salt consumption. Salt consumption in the Western diet is anywhere between four to six grams of salt a day. And when someone sees me for heart disease or high blood pressure, I tell them they need to reduce their salt consumption to less than two grams a day. Uh, additional examples of a poor diet is uh, a diet that's high in saturated fats, low intake of produce, namely fruits and vegetables. Physical inactivity is associated with hypertension. Inactivity is relative because the amount of activity I need to do in my 40s may be different than those in their 20s, and is certainly different than those in their 70s and 80s. But being inactive is pretty evident in the sense of if you're not moving and you're not getting breathless a few minutes a day, every day of the week, uh, you need to do more to potentially modify your risk of hypertension. Tobacco and alcohol consumption can certainly raise blood pressure. Tobacco, in fact, one of the pharmaceutical properties of tobacco is it squeezes the arteries, which is why it's such a damaging drug. Being overweight or obese can also um, result in hypertension. Things we cannot modify, but I think are important to know, is there a family history of hypertension? Did Ma, did Dada have it? Did my uncles have it? Do my siblings have it? That may put me at risk for blood pressure. Um, as we know in the previous slides, it, the prevalence of high blood pressure goes up with age. And above the age of 60, the prevalence is around 66%. And the lifetime risk is 90% for all adults. So it's important to know that as we age, blood pressure can go up. Certain ethnicities and genders, males, African-Americans, even South Asians, we have a higher incidence of hypertension. And other, co other coexisting comorbidities, such as diabetes, and kidney disease, that can also raise the risk of hypertension. What are the complications? We referred to that in the pictorial from a couple slides ago, but near and dear to my heart, of course, <laughs> literally and figuratively, is heart disease. Excessive pressure can harden the arteries. Hardening of the arteries can cause an impediment of flow to where it needs to go, flow being uh, blood flow, blood flow to the heart, causing heart disease, such as atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. Um, flow problems to the brain causing strokes. So when we refer to chest pain causing from heart disease, we call that angina or angina. Angina is a simple um, fancy term for discomfort in the chest because of, an, of, of a reduction in blood flow. When that happens for a prolonged period of time, that can lead to a heart attack. A heart attack can result from a blockage in one of the arteries that results in muscle damage to the heart pump. And over time, that can lead to a more menacing and challenging problem called congestive heart failure. And that happens when the heart is unable to keep up with the demands of the body. Part and parcel of all these things can be irregular heartbeats, something called atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat, putting patients at higher risks for congestive heart failure and stroke, and even something called ventricular fibrillation, which can cause sudden death. Um, of course, the brain blood flow problems are, uh, are stroke. And in addition, blood pressure can damage the kidneys. Blood pressure can damage the eyes when it's out of control. So why is this important to us as South Asians? It is because um, some of these statistics I think will be staggering. We may know them by anecdotes, but here they are in, uh, in print. South Asian Americans, so people who have roots from Nepal, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, the Maldives, um, they have a disproportionate higher risk of heart disease and other cardiovascular ailments. If you think of the worldwide population as 8 billion people, we South Asians uh, are 2 billion of that population, one quarter. But we account for 60% of all heart disease cases, a disproportionate number, right? We should account for a quarter, hopefully less than a quarter, but we don't. It's more than double that. A study by the American Heart Association in 2018 found that we are more likely to die of coronary heart disease than other Asian Americans and non-Hispanic white Americans. This study outlined um, several um, associated factors, including a higher incidence of diabetes and prediabetes and other risk factors such as a high waist to hip ratio and another fancy way or colloquial way of saying that is the proverbial Buddha belly, which is funny to say, but actually a very serious problem in our community. People of South Asian descent have a higher tendency to gain visceral fat around the belly which is associated with insulin resistance. Again, the, ins the issues of diet, exercise, diabetes, insulin resistance, all will be um, occurring in future lectures in detail. I'm just mentioning an overview. It also discovered in this study that South Asians were found to be less physically active than other ethnic groups in the US. 
we seem to, as South Asians, have more aggressive hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis. We seem to develop heart disease a decade earlier, even in our 40s. More visceral fat, as I stated, around the belly, around the heart, around the liver. And this visceral fat is associated with inflammation of the arteries. And that is, the, that is sort of the recipe for hardening of the arteries. We seem to have smaller diameter heart arteries or coronary arteries. We unfortunately seem to have more blockages and more blockages and more blood vessels resulting in not just stenting, but even bypass surgery. So it's a major problem. Um, as mentioned, we have a higher incidence of uh, sugar problems, diabetes and glucose intolerance or borderline diabetes. And our diets are unfortunately aren't as healthy as we think. Uh, I mentioned the South Asian paradox. I will then now sort of allude to the vegetarian paradox. Um, it's just because we are vegetarian or uh, many of us are vegetarian, including myself, doesn't necessarily mean, mean we are eating healthy. We have a very carb loaded diet with white rice, with uh, rotis and chapatis and naan. Uh, our heights are also, our diets are also associated with saturated fats from dairy, uh, cheese, butter, and oils. And unfortunately we bring to the table then these unfortunate um, 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 South Asian uh, diet habits and then introduce the Western diet, which uh, we have now fast foods at our fingertips. Uh, we can get Grubhub in the middle of a couple, couple um, you know, um, triggers on our, on our smartphones. So we blend the Eastern diet challenges and the Western diet challenges. And unfortunately it's a double whammy for badness. What can we do? I mean, this is, I'm mentioning lots of concerning things. This is not to say hope is lost. I think there's a lot we can do, and that's the good news. The good news is there's many, many things ahead of, the, um, ahead of taking a pill that we can do to reduce our risk of hypertension or to reduce our blood pressure if we have hypertension. Um, we know that reducing high blood pressure reduces the risk of strokes, heart attacks, and kidney damage, as well as other health problems. There's something called the DASH diet, and those of you who are interested in uh, in dietary approaches, this is exactly what the acronym stands for, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. This is not a Western specific diet. This is just a generic principle of heart healthy living and it entails reducing the salt intake. As I mentioned, the average diet incorporates about four to six grams of salt per, um, per day. And I tell my patients who have heart disease and hypertension, they need to reduce their salt intake to less than two grams a day. Two grams put um, pictorially is a teaspoon. And that's not just in uh, what you're putting on top of food, but it's what's built into food. So it's important that we all read labels. If we're making, making food from scratch, we know what a teaspoon is. If we're not making food from scratch, it's important to read the label of a canned um, beans or, um, or processed foods or frozen foods. We need to read labels. We need to incre increase our um, uh, in intake of produce, uh, fruits and vegetables, limiting the intake of foods that are high in trans and saturated fats, so I don't suggest maybe we need to eliminate, but I think we need to markedly reduce the consumption of ghee and specific kinds of oils that may be associated with this. Lean protein and whole grains should be increased in our diets. Being physically active on a regular basis. It's important that 30 minutes of cardiovascular fitness a day, most days of the week, can really get our bodies moving and can markedly reduce our blood pressures. And there is really no role of tobacco in the 21st century. It is a chemical that squeezes arteries and can raise blood pressure, eliminating alcohol and eliminating tobacco can lower blood pressure as well. Other things to do. Um, it's easy to say manage and reduce stress. I think all of us professionals who have uh, families, jobs, and a, a responsibility list that goes on and on, including myself, it's still important to take a few minutes of, out of your time. I know we do meditation and I'll speak about this in a few slides. Um, but it is important that we uh, maintain spiritual and mental health and managing stress. We know that uh, patients who have type A personalities, people who are really, really uh, perhaps on the edge, if you will, uh, their blood pressure seems to be higher. Um, and checking blood pressure. I think once you've been identified as having high blood pressure um, because your primary care doctor said you have a problem, then do check it regularly. Um, and again, watching your diet, exercise, um, even medications, which we'll get to in a, in a few slides. Um, weight loss, uh, as, a, as we have alluded to, if you lose weight five to 10% of the weight, it can drastically improve blood pressure and other health effects as well. So what else can we do to, um, um, to kind of move the needle here? I think if we're trying to avoid medication, I did allude to exercise, what specifically? It has to be age appropriate. You know, I think for... Um, 
the 20 and 30 year population to say, I'm only walking, I'm walking at a slow pace and I'm exercising. That is definitely better than not walking. But I think to get the benefit of cardiovascular fitness, that younger person needs to really push themselves. And that may be a jog, that may be a bike, that may be a swim, but they need to get their heart rate up. They need to feel breathless 30 minutes a day, most days of the week to get the true benefit of cardiac exercise. Now, fast forward, you know, people in their 60s and 70s, jogging may not be in the cards because of uh, you know, joint problems, arthritis, balance issues. Older patients don't need to run, don't need to jog, but they need to get their heart rate up. That could be a power walk. That could be anything to get the heart moving, get the joints moving so that you get breathless half an hour a day, most days of the week to get the true benefit of cardiac exercise. Um, increasing muscle mass, I think part and parcel of cardiac um, um, fitness is also uh, muscle building. Now muscle building doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to the gym and be lifting heavy, heavy weights. I think doing squats at home, doing push-ups, doing sit-ups, uh, doing things like light weights at home, that's more than enough. I think depending on the age category you fall into, and that's another way to be to build uh, lean muscle and incorporating more protein in the diet, which I think we have ways in our vegetarian diets to do that with between legumes and beans and soy protein. Again, uh, a, diet, a diet lecture will be given further down the road. Uh, so I'm just giving a brief overview here. And there may be a role also for yoga and meditation, being mindful. Related to yoga and meditation, um, I think you'd be interested to know as we, I, as we do meditation for about five minutes every Sunday that um, a, um, a study published in an alternative uh, medi a medicine journal from about eight years ago suggested um, that mindfulness and yoga and meditation reduced systolic and diastolic blood pressure in these different categories between four to eight points, uh, which I think is fantastic. I mean, I think lowering your blood pressure, uh, you know, four to eight points for both top and bottom um, is a wonderful, wonderful thing without, without a pill. Now, this is not to say that this, uh, this um, sort of uh, precludes exercise. I think this is to do in complement or in addition to exercise, in addition to uh, eating healthy. And these different, we say lifestyle modifications, we say this term broadly to our patients, but this is really what it entails. It's not saying, I'm just going to walk, I'm just going to eat healthy, or I'm just going to do yoga. You need to really consider doing all of these things. And this may be a way to move the needle and not have to take a medicine. Um, uh, so that would be one, one, uh, one thing to think about. With meditation, I think um, it would be, you know, not just a, a few minutes, but maybe even 10 to 20 minutes every morning. As we do it for Chin Mai Mission about five minutes every Sunday, think about incorporating this uh, Monday through Saturday. Um, what meditation can do, and again, it's a complicated kind of biochemical process of what bad things happen with hypertension and what medication can sort of work backwards, but the sympathetic nervous system or the adrenaline axis in the body in patients who have hypertension can sometimes be revved up. Cortisol levels can sometimes be revved up. Cortisol is a hormone that is associated with salt retention, high blood pressure, and, and adiposity or weight gain. So by doing meditation, it's been postulated that the sympathetic nervous system can sometimes calm down, cortisol levels can be decreased, and maybe blood flow to the body can be improved by maybe by a mediator called nitric oxide. What about medications? So this is not a lecture to say that everyone who has hypertension needs to take pills. And I'm also not here to say you shouldn't take pills. I think this is, again, uh, I'm, not, um, I, I'm not the physician, everyone in the audience today. This is not something that I would uh, make a broad statement of, um, of what to do. But I think it is imperative that you follow the guidance of your physician of, am I hypertensive? What stage am I? And may I try lifestyle modifications for the first, say, three to six months between yoga, meditation, exercise, diet changes, the DASH diet, those things to really reduce blood pressure. But I think once that has been exhausted or once that has been done, in addition to that uh, would be the consideration of medications. It's imperative that someone who is labeled as hypertensive really know the numbers. So check your blood pressure regularly once you've been labeled as a high blood pressure patient. Some broad categories of medicines by no means exhaustive, uh, but just a, a few uh, categories that uh, ones who take medicines may be familiar with. Uh, the ABCD mnemonic. So A is ACE inhibitors or ARBs. These are medicines that dilate blood vessels. B stands for beta blockers. These are medicines that really help relax the heart. I wrote here, help the heart chill out. Calcium channel blockers is C. These are medicines that dilate blood vessels or they help the heart chill out or both. D is diuretics. These are medicines that work at the level of the kidneys. 
They allow for uh, patients to maybe go to the bathroom a little bit more as a means of decreasing blood volume and possibly tension on the blood vessels. So why should we do this? What's, what's in it for me, right? I mean, I don't feel bad, so why should I bother doing this? And I think we can say that I think all of us want to live healthy. Um, if we control our blood pressure by age 50, we can actually live potentially five years longer. As I suggested earlier, every 20 points of your top number or even every 10 points of your bottom number you bring down, you can decrease your risk of stroke by half. Avoiding heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure, vision loss, that's key. We wanna live a good life, a healthy life. And unfortunately, it's not as though uncontrolled hypertension takes us out in one moment. It can be a very miserable process that I see on a regular basis. And it's best avoided if we simply know our numbers and control them. Remembering that blood pressure will likely affect most people in this audience, 90% lifetime risk. Knowing that our BMIs, our blood pressures, our sugar control, we may need tire control as South Asians. And I think um, I'm very mindful of the fact when I see an Indian patient that um, though they may seem relatively leaner or, or thinner and they may be vegetarian, that's not to say that they may be healthier and the risk of heart disease may paradoxically may not be less, but maybe more. We wanna make sure that we serve, um, as, as we are part of Chin Mai Mission, we are part of this community. We wanna be good role models, not just for our children, but also for our community. I think one of the mottos I've really um, um, subscribed to and really uh, appreciated about Chin Mai Mission, it's to give maximum happiness to the maximum number for the maximum time. We wanna stay healthy for that reason. Poor health can really be a challenge, not just for the patient or the individual, their family, the healthcare system, and for society at large. So prevention and knowledge is key. And I think with that, uh, that is the conclusion of my lecture. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm open to your feedback and your dialogue. Hariyom Kunjanji, uh, thank you for the talk. Lots of information to take in. Uh, <laughs> we do have a couple of questions that have come in through the chat. Um, I will start reading them out. Uh, People in the audience, you can either send a question to me, Lalita, uh, as the host, or you can raise your hand and then I will get to you um, in order that I see on my um, screen. And the, so, Lalita, if you don't mind just reading out the questions, uh, just because I don't know that I'm going to be able to see them. So I don't know yes. if you could just moderate sure. your questions, that would be great. I will, I will definitely call out the questions. Um, the first question that we have is, is there a difference in recommended higher or lower limit of blood pressure in Asian community compared to the general population? Yeah, it's a great question. I think if we could, uh, Lalita Ji in the question ask her, um, if we could actually just get to 130 by 80 or less, um, that would be a great first step. Uh, there are currently, to my knowledge, no specific guidelines to say that, um, blood pressure needs to be even tighter in the South Asian population at large. That's not to say that specific populations, especially diabetic patients, the diabetic patients and other, there are other um, at-risk people, um, but in general, South Asians, I think can strive for 130 by 80 or less. Um, and I think that would be a good starting point. Once we can achieve that, um, I think that will be a big win for our, pop, for our community. Okay, and a related question to that, what is the goal of BP in people over age 70, seven zero? Yeah, um, it's, uh, so I'll tell you there are guide, in the guidelines and I've, I intentionally left this out because it's uh, in my opinion, somewhat controversial. Um, the most recent guidelines for hypertension suggested that the elderly described at 65, which I sort of take issue with. I don't think 65 is elderly. <laughs> um, over, above 65, the idea that um, you can actually have a blood pressure of 140 by 90 or less, and that is actually okay. The idea here is that um, there are a lot of challenges, I'm sure, as we all know, by taking a medication and the potential side effect of medications. So what the newest guidelines accounted for is the morbidity or the feeling bad issue of taking a pill and being normal tensive. Um, so there was a little bit more leniency in the older population that doesn't have any heart disease. So these are not people who have diabetes. These are not people who have heart disease or heart failure. 
if you are a healthy 66 year old person, the newest guidelines allows for more leniency for your blood pressure to be in the 140s over 80s or less and to be considered normotensive. To me, that is permissive hypertension that is actually allowing for slightly higher numbers. We know that the population as it ages, as we age, we are now aging into our 80s, even into our 90s. Um, my concern would be the number of years at risk that we allow these numbers to be a little higher potentially can cause more problems uh, down the road. We don't know what that looks like yet. So uh, it is absolutely true that if, for the person who asked that, uh, that above the age of 65, there is some permission, if you, if you will, there is some allowance for permissive hypertension, 140s by 80s or less. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that the healthcare community and especially the cardiology community has blindly adopted to it. Um, so again, it's a, it's, a, it's a per individual dialogue with your provider. I have this all the time. It's not to say that I have not allowed some of my 70 and 80 year old patients to be in that range, but I think I would say that's the exception and not the rule. Thank you, Kunjanji. Uh, one other question related to diet. What are some good sources of vegetarian lean protein? Uh, is there a place where we can get additional information on such protein sources? Great question. We are going to have a dedicated lecture on this exact topic, but I, I would say in general, um, uh, legumes, beans, soy protein are all excellent sources. And um, not, to, um, um, not to dismiss the question at all, because this is actually going to be an entire lecture, but I would say for the time being, suffice it to say beans, legumes, <coughs> soy protein, are, I think are all excellent sources. For those of us like myself who are vegetarian, we don't eat, I don't eat fish, I don't eat chicken. I'm, uh, I'm not a vegan, uh, but certainly um, yogurt would be another one. So if those of you who eat dairy, um, yogurt would be another, um, uh, another source but we'll have an, a dedicated lecture, Lalita Ji, on this topic exactly, because this I think will be a very helpful talk, topic for those of us who want to sort of um, uh, dance away from the, the South Asian vegetarian paradox of uh, high carbs and, and, and very little protein. Okay, um, I have one more question here. Um, could be uh, very specific, but I'm going to go ahead and read it out. What does it mean if someone has a bicuspid valve in their heart? A bicuspid valve in the heart is a, uh, so it refers to one of the valves of the heart. It actually doesn't relate to hypertension, but it's something that you are born with. Um, statistics say that about 1% of the population has this problem. It is um, the main valve of the heart, the aortic valve actually has three parts to it. In certain individuals around 1%, it actually has two parts to it. So two parts are stuck together and then the valve opens abnormally and closes abnormally. Over time, that can cause that valve to malfunction. And typically somewhere between age 30 and age 50, that valve becomes very dysfunctional and may need the attention of a valve operation because that valve is not functioning properly. But the good news is high blood pressure um, um, doesn't necessarily create a risk for having that problem. So um, yeah, but it's a challenge nonetheless and it's a genetic, a congenital problem. It, you have it since birth. Okay, um, I guess there is one more question related to Asian community. Is there, in, is there more incidences of labeled hypertension in the Asian community? Yeah, I think so. I've read lots of studies um, uh, before giving this talk because I, I, um, I don't know that I would consider myself the hypertension guru. I'm really seeing the end effects of this. But in the primary care literature, especially going to India, the incidence of hypertension in India from what I've read is anywhere around 30, 30 to 33% seemingly lower. What I worry about, especially from India, is are we getting all the data, right? I think we are an up and coming nation in India. So health information is drastically evolving. Uh, people, I think more people are getting access to healthcare. Um, and I think um, as, um, as that happens, that incidence may go up, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, in the States, I think uh, we may not be the most hypertensive. So looking at that statistic from, uh, I think the first or second slide, uh, we are actually behind um, African Americans and Caucasians, but the numbers are still unfortunate and high. We're somewhere in the 40% range. So I think it's one of these things that, um, yes, it's about 40% in the States for our community, um, around 33% in India. So it's probably somewhere in the middle there. Uh, I don't know how India's statistics may evolve as more people get access to care and, um, and, and, and get their blood pressure checked. 
Okay. Um, right now, I do not have any other questions that have been um, posted here related to uh, questions for you, Kunjunji. Um, if anybody else has questions, um, either raise your hand. If you have your camera on, maybe I can see your raised hand um, or um, you know, raise your Zoom hand, blue hand or yellow hand, whatever it is. Uh, if we don't have any additional questions, then um, we will conclude. Um, I'll just give everybody just a few seconds. We did get one more question. So we, you talked about hypertension. So what about low blood pressure? So if you have been consistently told that you have low blood pressure, what is the good and bad about that? That's a great question. Um, a lot of the defining of low blood pressure revolves around symptoms and who that person is. So I think uh, many of our ch children go to their pediatrician, get their blood pressure checked and it's 85 over 65, it's 90 over, over 60. Um, several adults, including people in my family have those numbers even at an adult age. It doesn't mean necessarily anything sinister. In fact, having normal to low normal blood pressure numbers is actually not a bad thing. I don't know that there's any sort of, um, a, a, of, a, of, a, of a heart ill effect of that. Now, there are populations of people who have low blood pressure in which it is a problem. Um, if you have heart disease, for example, if you have a weak heart, that is the manifestation, the, the vital sign manifestation of a weak heart that your blood pressure is low. So low blood pressure in and of itself is not bad. It is commonly associated with thin, younger people. That's not to say that more overweight, older people can't have low blood pressure as well. There are some hormonal disturbances or some hormonal imbalances that can result in low blood pressure. So I think once you have been labeled as low blood pressure, it's important to dialogue with your physician to make sure that this is not some sinister problem, which for the most part, in people who don't have symptoms, it's not a sinister problem. And if it is a problem, then it's important to get that workup to look at the different axes of, we discussed cortisol, sometimes not having enough cortisol in the blood or in the body can cause low blood pressure. And there are a whole host of issues. Sometimes, sometimes thyroid disease can result in low blood pressure. So there are other hormone challenges that can cause blood pressure derangement and, and even low pressure. And there are certain patients who have heart disease, like a weak heart or congestive heart failure. Some of my patients in my practice who have this condition, they walk around with blood pressures in the 80s, but that is not a, that is what they have. That is not normal. And um, that is sort of an accepted um, allowance given that their heart is not pumping strongly, their heart is pumping weakly. So great question. Okay. Um, and just to remind everybody, what is considered a low blood pressure for a normal, I guess, an adult? Yeah, I would say probably 90 over 60 or less would be considered low. And the 90s and 60s would be considered borderline low. I think acceptable normal numbers would be in the hundreds or in the 60s to 70s on the bottom. So 90 by 60 or less, um, although that's not really well defined. I think they're defined low blood pressure in certain disease states. It's not sort of defined in the general public, but I would say by common practice in the 90 by 60 or less range would be considered absolutely low. Okay, uh, related to that, is there an ideal time to check blood pressure? And do you have any recommendations for good home BP monitoring device? Yeah, great question. So um, recommended times would be, um, I think the wrong time, I'll start off by saying what's the wrong time. Remember blood pressure responds to stress. We do stress tests on patients on a regular basis. And if you've ever had a stress test, you'll know that over time, as you exert yourself more and more, your blood pressure goes up. So the wrong time to check your blood pressure is during times of stress. You had a busy day, you had a stressful day, you come home, you check your blood pressure. If you are a high blood pressure patient, it actually may be high. If you've had a stressful conversation, if you are sort of, your mind is not engaged with health, but it's more on the board meeting you had or on finances or on a family challenge, your blood pressure is gonna be high. Our, our advice as physicians and my advice in my practice has always been check your blood pressure first thing in the morning after your morning routine. So your morning routine may be, you know, bathing, brushing, moving your bowels, moving your bladder, taking your morning medications, checking your blood pressure afterwards. 
Now, that's not to say that if you don't take medications I and mean, you don't, that you can check your blood pressure first thing in the morning. Um, so I think it is earlier in the morning to really know what your resting blood pressure is. We know with activity, we know every blood pressure number is truly reflective of that, that moment in time, but we want to manage our resting numbers. So um, resting blood pressures in the morning, uh, if for those who take medications for it, maybe after the morning medicines. Um, probably the best way to describe the blood pressure uh, machines to use, automated blood pressure machines are, are perfectly valid. Couple things there, I would make sure that the blood pressure machine is a uh, not a wrist cuff, an arm cuff may be more accurate. Uh, there are many, many brands out there and I simply tell patients, go to the pharmacy, ask your pharmacist, which one do they like the most because they are seeing the ones that come back for refunds. Um, there's a brand called Omron, O-M-R-O-N. I'm not, uh, I don't work for them. I have nothing to disclose related to that company, but that's touted to be a good blood pressure brand, O-M-R-O-N, Omron. Um, that being said, it doesn't really matter, provided two things. One is that you're getting consistent readings. And number two, when you purchase that cuff, you take it to your, your primary care doctor and you have them check blood pressure and then you use your cuff simultaneously on the opposite arm to make sure you're getting a number that's within five and 10 points. If you have a blood pressure cuff that's getting five and 10 points within your physician's cuff, it's probably reasonable to use at home. If you're getting a blood pressure that's 20 or 30 points off, you may wanna uh, consider getting another cuff. So blood pressure cuff, uh, arm better than wrist, um, size of the blood pressure cuff, sorry, last point, blood pressure cuff size counts too. If you have large arms and you're checking an itty bitty blood pressure cuff, um, that may give you a falsely elevated reading. If you have uh, very small arms and you have a massive blood pressure machine or a, a larger diameter cuff, that may give you a falsely low blood pressure reading. So your diameter of your blood pressure cuff should be slightly larger than your arm diameter. Uh, not to get too technical, and if you have any questions about that, your, your primary care doctor can always discuss that sort of with you, but uh, the appropriate diameter blood pressure cuff, um, checking it in the morning, and, and, uh, and an arm more than a wrist cuff would be my thoughts. Okay. We do have one person who I think raised their hand on video, uh, Rao Vemugantiji. Uh, I'm going to let you unmute and ask your question. Um, Last question. Can you, okay, yeah. go ahead, Ramji. No, okay. My question is, uh, since you are a vegetarian too, so what are the, if you are a vegetarian, what are the source of uh, B12, you know? Yeah. So, uh, because we are not seeing any, see, in vegetarians, we are not noticing any, uh, B12 deficiency, but I'm a nutritionist. So usually students ask me, hey, I'm not taking anything different. I don't have any deficiency. So what could be the sources of vitamin B12 in a vegetarian diet? Yeah, Raoji, that's a great question. I, I, I wouldn't claim to be uh, having the uh, higher level of knowledge as a nutritionist would, and unfortunately, I myself am B12 deficient. <laughs> so um, I don't know that our vegetarian diet complements the full, um, uh, the full breadth of, 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 uh, of vitamins. So sometimes some supplementation is required. Um, but to your point, Rauji, we will have lectures dedicated to, uh, to diet and, and sort of its impact on, on, um, on the heart and on, um, on risk factors for heart disease. So I unfortunately don't have an answer for that, Rauji. I think it's... Um, going to be sort of an individual dialogue. I don't know if natural supplements robust enough to replace the B12 deficiency that is, as you've alluded to, pretty rampant amongst vegetarians. Uh, but I welcome certainly your insight or if anyone else on this thread who may know. Okay, my second question is, if you have a blood pressure and uh, the person is in uh, 80s and, uh, and also arthritis, so regular int intake of Tylenol, will it hurt their kidneys? That's a great question. I'm so glad you've asked that. Um, so a very, common, a very common patient profile you've described that we see, someone, an octogenarian, an 80-year-old person who has joint problems, has joint pain, needs to take pain medications and takes uh, um, a Tylenol or the um, generic for Tylenol is acetaminophen. Um, 
I actually, so again, uh, I think there are advantages and disadvantages of different medicines, but acetaminophen or generic Tylenol doesn't really have any harmful effects on blood pressure, doesn't really have any harmful effects within the recommended guidelines for uh, liver or for kidneys. Again, talk to your physicians. I'm not trying to give all people on this thread, go take Tylenol today. But I think it's one of these things, it is thought to be perhaps a little bit safer vis-a-vis -vis heart disease patients, kidney disease patients, or even patients who are concerned about their liver. Um, it is a medicine that is um, maybe not as robust because there aren't any anti-inflammatory properties for Tylenol, but as an analgesic, as a medicine that helps ease pain, it is a reasonable thing to think about. Thank and you. I have a, a personal question. I'm in mid eighties and 20, I'm a patient of uh, Austin Heart. My, my cardiologist is Dr. Goswami. Previously, he used to be Dr. Dixon, and since he retired, Goswami took over. My personal question is, 26 years ago, I had an open-heart surgery at Seton, and my four arteries were replaced. I didn't have any symptoms, but anyway, it was replaced. And lately, I was getting shortening of breath. I mean, there's no pattern. Uh, only when, when I'm dressing, when I'm wearing shoes, I get a sharp, shortening of breath. When I'm talking on the phone, the other side of the party, they can see, they can hear the gasping. So I, I checked with my cardiologist, he did the echocardiogram and other things, nothing was there. And eventually he wanted to see the bottom of the problem. And recently he did an angiogram at Austin Hospital and Dr. Picon is the one who did the angiogram. He said, everything is normal. So he was amazed after 26 years, all the four, four arteries are open. He was amazed. And Dr. Goswami said, I see this, I see as if the surgery was done yesterday, but still I have that gasp, I mean, shortening of breath, what it could be. I mean, it's only, there's no pattern. Only when I'm dressing, when I'm wearing shoes, I get the gas, but it's not interfering with my normal tasks. What would be the reason? Still, I'm planning to see my primary physician, Dr. Michael Preet. I'm, I have an appointment on Tuesday, but uh, what, what is uh, your take on that? Raji, thank you for that thoughtful question, and uh, I hope you do feel better. I think um, just to keep it broad for the audience, and um, and I I, I want to be careful to make recommendations to situations that I don't know the full details. So I I, um, I caution in my response to say that I think this is just a a broad discussion of what can make someone feel short of breath who has had previous heart disease and bypass surgery from over two decades ago. What else could be going on? I think in broad categories, heart disease, lung disease, and deconditioning um, are the things that I sort of discuss with my patients when they come to me with those symptoms. Heart disease, I think, has been looked at, sounds like pretty extensively. Lung disease should not be ignored. Um, I think the lungs are also a, a, a place where gas exchange occurs. We take in oxygen, it goes into our blood, we expel carbon dioxide. And I think um, when that happens uh, or that's impaired, that can make you feel short of breath. Um, at the muscular level, uh, you know, our lean body mass or our muscles, uh, our, our, our amount of muscles, if you will, can go down with time. Our adiposity can go up. Our weights can change in a disproportionate, not good way. Deconditioning as you get older can happen. And I think it's important before we sort of say this is uh, deconditioning or being maybe relatively speaking out of shape that you've had a thorough look by your primary care doctor and whoever else your primary care doctor wants to refer you to. But that's a great question, and I really do hope you feel better. Hope so. I have an appointment on Tuesday, so. Best wishes. Check, check with him. Michael Pitt with Austin Regional Clinic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Raji. Uh, Kunjan, we are coming up on the hour, but I'm, I want to ask one last question, and then we will uh, conclude. Um, the question is, is there any guidance for kids? What and when should they be checking on their cholesterol, other heart-related numbers? This yeah. is related to kids. Yeah, great question. I think um, 
I don't know the cholesterol guidelines for pediatric patients, um, to be totally transparent. And I think we look forward to the cholesterol lecture, which we will have um, to dialogue about what the appropriate thing may be for pediatric patients for blood pressure. Um, pediatric patients do get their blood pressure checked. I, I've attended my son and my daughter's visits to know that as a fact. I think I'll, I'll approach this sort of, so the guidelines in pediatrics for treating hypertension, the incidence is so much less, right? I think we said in their 18, from 18 to 30s, the incidence is 7.5%, or I'm sorry, the prevalence is 7.5%. I think in the teenage category and younger, the prevalence is extremely low, but um, there is beyond innate disorders and hormonal disorders and other diseases that primarily cause hypertension. I have seen in my, my um, heart screens that we do at the heart hospital, we have since the pandemic, but we have done heart screens where we do bring in youth athletes and we do their blood pressures, their echoes, their EKGs. So I've seen plenty of vital signs in young athletes and it seems to fit, um, not to generalize, but, but the sort of phenotype or this appearance of the uh, overweight individual um, um, who maybe uh, have more central or, or, or abdominal adiposity. It may be say, for example, the football player who's on the offensive line. Um, they may be the right mass for that sports position, but they may not be the wrong body type to maintain normal tension for their life. Um, that's a challenge. And I don't, I ever, never want to pretend to tell parents and students that they shouldn't be doing what they're doing or have the, the body type they do. But I think to arm uh, these youth athletes, uh, our kids and their parents for lifelong health, um, it's important to know those numbers. And so same numbers, I would, I would tell my patients, I would tell the, the kids that, uh, again, if you're in the 140s and, and, and 80s to 90s, your blood pressure is high. Um, I think most, most kids are fairly active, but those habits don't, oh, sorry, those, um, those blood pressure numbers, that trajectory may not change, in fact, may get worse over time. So um, I think it's, again, it's a dialogue with the pediatrician to say uh, this blood pressure isolated in the office of 140 by 80 in my youth athlete who may be a little overweight, what do I do about that? I think the same sort of rules apply, maybe a little bit more challenging. And I think taking it one step further, you have to look at the family. I think um, there may be sometimes a, 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 a family body habit is type. Then this may be an overweight family. family. There may be a cultural issue here, or there may be sort of a, 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 a um, um, I know that we, um, it's a whole different dialogue uh, to say that, um, that, you know, healthy foods and junk foods and their costs and sort of the ability to get them, it's a whole, um, whole different lecture. But I think suffice it to say, um, blood pressure may not be as in vogue in the pediatric population to know the numbers because kids are focused on other things. But those habits occur early, sedentary lifestyles, you know, electronic gadgetry, um, maybe not eating the healthiest, but certainly those, um, those challenges can be felt lifelong. So very important. And I'm glad you brought up that point. Okay, um, we are on the hour. Uh, we have been here longer than we expected, but thank you, Kunjinji, for uh, accommodating us and letting us ask the questions that we have. Um, if folks have additional questions, please do send it. You can send it to info at chinmayaaustin.org and we will make sure that they will get forwarded or perhaps give us some ideas of what we can uh, bring in for future talks. Uh, that will definitely help us out. Um, and Amina Aunty, would you like to add anything? You're on mute, Amina Aunty. Gunjan, this was a very helpful overview of high blood pressure. And I think with the questions from the audience, we covered a great ground. Uh, I know there's diurnal variation of blood pressure and sometimes the highest readings are early in the morning. That is just how nature has it. So checking it several times a day, especially in a person with what is some numbers is helpful. And that's where blood pressure monitoring uh, at home comes in. But it was very good. I think we started off with a bang. Thank you very much, Kunja. Thank you, everyone, and Hariyom. 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 Hariyom.